So, in talent readiness, uh, just a little bit about what we do. Um, we people data to help companies make decisions about hiring and developing people. So that's our business. So we add it to the people business. I think there's going to be some uh, correlations. I invite you to consider that you're in the same business that we are as we go through this presentation. So here's the numbers. These numbers are where we start. It's like using data. Numbers are still the same, even though there's a delay. So what are the, what are the numbers that jump out at you? What, what's going on with the generations? What's that? Yeah, big dip. About eight and a half million people, Delta. There's baby boomers, which I'm of that generation, are retiring at about 12,000 a day or leaving the workforce at about 12,000 a day. And in two and a half years, 97 or 93% of the baby boomers will be out of the workforce. It creates a gap. It's the biggest generation, right? Uh, but if you notice the generations that follow, we have some sons who are in Gen Z. There's about an eight. $0.5 million, dollar, or million uh, people gap in terms of who, who's available for employment. Now, some of that you can automate, but a lot of it is going to create a problem, right? It's a different world today than it was when I came out of college and started working. There were probably 50 of us for every job. Now there's 50 jobs for every person. So it creates a little bit of a different dynamic, and I think some of that's true in your business, right? There are probably fewer people that are, you know, available for college, so it's you're having some of those competitive uh, challenges that we have helping companies as well. So it's, first of all, it's a math problem. You can't, you can't you know, listen to the news, we can't do anything about it. Well, you can do things about it. And you heard some things from Stan earlier, and I'm gonna share some things for, with you that I think will help you deal with this challenge of scarcity. So how do we deal with it? The other factor is participation in labor rates. It's gone down as well. Um, that means, one of the reasons we kind of wonder why is that true for 70 years it's been measured, there's less people participating. Well, part of it is a baby boomer again. What's happening in our generation is we have the largest wealth transfer in the history of the United States going on between the baby boomers and the next generation. I think it's $60 trillion that the baby boomers have in, in savings, investments, and equity. And, and if they can't spend it all before they die, so let's just say 30 trillion of it will get transferred. That impacts some people's willingness to work or interest in working when they know there's 30 tr trillion dollars that are going to be inherited. So that's another factor we, f we fight in the, in the labor or the talent wars, as we call it. So this is what's going on. This is the world in which we work, operate. So there's two realizations that really come from this that I think impact you as well. In order to win the talent war, somebody has to lose, right? You talked about competition, differentiation. If, if it's a scarcity of, of supply, then uh, some, some organization's gonna have to do it better than others. You're gonna have to compete and win versus your uh, competitors. And the other th thing is, pe people in our world, we need people more than they need us in terms of the job world. So it might be a little bit true with your business too. There's a lot of people that have options online. There's a lot of choices they have to get educated. Some people are re-examining that whole idea of education. So you've got to be even better at what you do than you probably had to be 20 years ago. You know, so that's why you have to you know, use the tools and the analytics and all the things that are available because it's a different world. The numbers support it, right? The numbers don't lie. It's a different world that we all have to compete in. That's what we work with our clients with is figuring out how do they win, get their unfair share, if you will, of the talent that's available out there in the world uh, using, uh, using analytics. All right. Anybody recognize this? This is, uh, my kids are now adults, Gen Z. When they were little, they played this game, FIFA. And, and you can see up here, and don't argue with the data. Well, I don't think, I think that score's too low or for Ronaldo, but basically, this is all the data my kids used to put together their teams on this game, PlayStation, FIFA, football, or soccer, right? And here's my challenge to you. If my kids use more data to configure their PlayStation teams than you use to make people decisions, we should talk. <laughs> That's why we're here, right? I, I mean that. If my kids are using more analytics to make decisions about configuring their soccer team on PlayStation or, or Xbox, that's probably something that's an opportunity. And so I'm going to show you today in the time we have together how you can use data, if you're not already using it, to make people decisions to help optimize the, the experience of your students. And, all right. I started out in the medical industry. 
My wife and I are, are co-founders and partners in our business, and we both grew up in healthcare. And can you imagine this? If you went in to see the doctor and you gave, a, you gave him a, what they call a patient history, you told him what's wrong with you, you described your symptoms, and the doctor said, that's interesting. I'm going to schedule surgery 3 o'clock today. Are you available? What would be your reaction? <laughs> that's right. You'd be scared, right? You'd probably run. You'd probably, I'm not, you haven't even done any blood work. You haven't done any diagnostics. You're taking patient history and making a decision, right? And if you knew there's a 50% success rate if that surgery, that's another data that might get your attention. This is the hiring world it, that we work with. Most of our clients don't use data. They take a patient history, which is the resume and the interview, and they make a hiring decision with about a 50% success rate. That's, that's kind of scary. I mean, you think about that. You know, hiring, there's, we got a scarcity of people and we're not doing a good job of figuring out who's a good fit for the organization because we don't use data. We don't understand people at the deepest level. So this is something that I, I wanted to throw out there. And, and you call it malpractice if somebody did this in the healthcare. And we think it happens all the time. So who thinks these two lines are different lengths? You ever seen this one? Yeah. They're the same length, right? And when Stan was talking earlier, he was talking about biases, right? We all have cognitive biases. Part of the use of data in making people decisions is to kind of overcome those, those biases that we have, those instant decisions that we make, the fight or flee, the operating out of the lower brain. Most, uh, most common bias we have is the confirmation bias. You see this in a lot of politics, and you see it, you know, the overlap between what the facts say, which we undervalue, what confirms your beliefs, which can be foolish, and what's overvalued is the intersection of, well, what, what I believe and what the facts support. That's the middle, that the Venn diagram. So that's, con that's confirmation bias. And what we're trying to do is use data to try to not fall into the trap of saying, well, this person has this profile, therefore they're going to be successful without, you know, really looking at it a little deeper. So that's one of the reasons we use data is to help overcome biases. And I'll, I'll share some examples with you. Uh, real world as well. So we're trying to use data to make sure we don't fall into the traps that are out there for us. So I'm going to give you a real world example of a company um, using the data that you took. How many people brought their predictive index report with them today? They have it? Hands? No? Oh, there's a few. Okay, good. I'm going to share a little bit about that. I won't ask you to share your data, but if you have it in front of you, you might want to reference it as we go through this next little se uh, section. So exemplars. What we often hear, and I'm sure you would, same with students, is we talk to our clients and we say, if you, if you could clone one of your employees, would you want to do that? One of your best employees, would you want to get 10 more of those? And they say, absolutely, I'd want to find 10 more just like this, right? Your exemplars are your top performers. It's the same with students. I can guarantee you they wouldn't have cloned me at the university I went to. I was not an exemplar. But if they wanted to know what do our exemplars look like, you can know that through the behavioral data. And so what I'm going to show you is real data from a client. And I'm going to walk you through it. It's a little bit busy, but you don't need to be an expert. You can see where the differences are. This is about 300, 300 people in a job, in a specific job in a company. And, and it's going to show you the, there's factors. You all took the behavioral assessment. There's four factors, the A, the B, the C, and the D. The A factor, for those who are interested, if you look at the midpoint, you see that little line, it looks like a hash mark with a little triangle in the middle. The further you are to the left or the right, the stronger that drive is on the self chart, the top chart, okay? So the A, A drive says, how do you uh, value and generate ideas, right? If you're very far to the right, you're very independent. You like to generate ideas on your own. If you're very far to the left, you like to collaborate. My wife and I are very different on that, and we're in the same business. I have a very high A. What she says is, I like my idea the best. What she likes is the best idea. <laughs> and there's a difference, right? Because I'm independently driven. High A tend to like their ideas, tend to sell people on their idea. Low A's tend to say, hey, let's get everything on the table. Let's collaborate and figure out what the best solution is. That's the difference on the A. If you look at this chart, the dark bar are the top performers, the top 10% you know, performers in this job role. The rest of the population in that job role is the red bar. If you look at factor A, it's pretty obvious there's a difference, right? If you were hiring, would this be interesting to know about a candidate that they had a very high or low A? If you knew, in fact, that data says that the people who knock it out of the park in this job role 
have a very high A that's in this range? Would that be interesting to have in your back pocket if you were looking at candidates or students, right? Do you think, you, do you think there are profiles for your students who do very well in accounting? They, they might have a profile that expresses you know, similarly, right? So if we're talking about you know, getting people to be successful, part of it is putting them in a place where their natural strengths and their natural drives are sated, right, where it fits, where it's natural for them to show up and express. So in this case, very high A, the B factor is how you communicate. In this case, a little bit low, a little bit to the left, it's lower, um, means communication. If you're high, you tend to think out loud. You don't have a filter, my wife would say. I don't have a filter. I kind of barge into her office and share ideas when she doesn't want me to share them. And a low B tends to be more reflective. Like, hey, I need some time. Get out of my space. Give me some time to reflect. If you're in the middle, you tend to be adaptive in any of these. You can flex either way. So a low B is like, hey, I need time. Don't push me for a decision. Give me some time to curl up with the data. Let me reflect. High B can't wait to talk about their idea. And they're bouncing Betty all over the office, you know, darkening your door, saying, hey, I got a great idea. And the low B sees them coming and tries to get the door shut as fast as possible. That's generally the difference. In this case, they tend to be a little lower B. Not so much of a difference, though, between the top performers and the low and the, and the average performer. The next one, the C drive. This is what kind of work environment do you like? A low C to the left and middle likes a fast pace. My wife would call them sprinters, like a lot of balls in the air. A lot of things going on, a lot of juggling. High C likes predictability and a, a steady pace, more of a marathoner. All right? In this case, the top performers here like a fast pace. Right? What kind of work environment? It matters. You think work environment or environment in a learning impacts people's experience? If you know somebody likes a lot of variety, would that impact the way you deliver their experience to them? Right? You wouldn't want to overwhelm somebody with a high C that likes steady with a lot of different you know, choices, you'd, you'd approach them differently, wouldn't you? Trying to tailor their experience. It's hard to tailor something if you don't have data. right? You can't personalize something if you don't understand what activates or motivates somebody. So this is, this is the data that says low C in this case, and this company was very attractive. The D, which all you have, high or low, in this case it's not very predictive, it's kind of not, doesn't jump out, is how much do you follow process and systems? High D, far to the right, very high process and system following. Low D, processes are just a suggestion. I'm going to do what I want to do. Right? A lot of our founders, like artists, you know, the typical entrepreneur, right, is a very low D. It's like, just water down the dust. The idea is what matters, you know, and they need people around them to build the process and systems. So, you know, that's important, too. If you were going to peg me and I said I want to be an accountant and come into your school, I want to study accounting, and you asked me why, well, my uncle and my father were accountants, and I hear they make good money, and there's a lot of opportunities to find jobs, and I had a very low D, I might, that might be a red flag. If I'm going into accounting, and I don't like process and systems, and I, I'm not very steady, I don't have a C that's very high, that might be an indication that that's not going to be a major I might do well in, because I'm not, I'm not going there with, with a natural fit. It doesn't work for me. It's not a good fit for me. Does that make sense? Does this resonate? The E. What's the E? The E factor, again, is not really a big difference here, but this is how you make decisions. You tend to be more objective to the right. Far to the right is objective. Very, it's, on, it's on the third chart on your report, on the, uh, on the last chart, on the bottom of the E. Far to the right, I use data. I'm a data person. I don't, you know, I'm not intuitive as much. It's more about the data. Far to the left, it's more intuitive. You tend to make decisions based more on an instinct and your, your feelings about things, okay? So real data. Understanding top performers in a company, in a specific job role, right? Everything's contextual. The profile in a different job role, the success would look different, right? It's contextual. It's like a major. You know, a math major might look different than a marketing major in terms of what that profile is optimal. You know, what your top performers look like. Now, if you knew this data, how could you use that to personalize the experience about people that you're interfacing with? Do you think it might influence the way you contact them, the data you share, how you talk to them? Does that, does that make sense? It's, it's available. It's certainly there. And anybody who, did, it, did most people find the accurate uh, profile? Did you find it accurate when you took it? Pretty accurate. Spooky accurate sometimes, right? I mean, you just picked words. You just picked adjectives. You know, that's all you did. You asked two questions. You picked words. The brain science behind it's amazing. 
basically what happens is you pick words that don't create a cortisol reaction in your brain. They don't stress you. Words that stress you, you avoid. Collaboration stresses the heck out of me. So I, didn't, I don't pick that word. <laughs> Independence, I love. You know? Rogue, oh, that's a good word, rogue. <laughs> that, that resonates with me. That's how it works. You picked words, and by the way you picked those words, your brain was firing up or not, and that creates your pattern. Right? 17 different profiles you can be one of. You have, some of you have stickers on your, on your um, name badge. My wife would want me to say that there's no good or bad profile. Right? It is. It's true. There are better or worse profiles for certain job roles, though. Right? There are some profiles where if you put me in accounting, it'd be difficult. And there are some probably profiles for you that if those kids or those students go down a path in a major, they might struggle more because it's not natural for them. It's, it's more difficult for them to be more detail-oriented when that's not the way they're wired. Everybody can flex. You know, don't hear me that you can't flex a little bit, but it's hard to flex if it requires a big shift. Right? We can all shift a little bit, but it's hard to maintain. And when it really, <laughs> I say the mask comes off under two circumstances. At the intersection of stress and expectations, most of the time you find out what your pattern really is. Because <laughs> we usually revert under stress to what's natural right, to who we are. All right, so real data with a client. This is very insightful. If you're gonna, if they're trying to do the best job of hiring the best people to hit the ground running, they have some pretty interesting data. Pay attention to two factors at a minimum, right? The A and the C. That's just, this is what this data is used for. All, all behavioral, and it took, how long did it take you? Four minutes to take that assessment? To answer the questions, four minutes, five minutes? It wasn't a gulag, right? It wasn't a death march. You just picked words, and before you know it, you add your report. So minimally invasive, extremely accurate, and it comes from the 50s. This, this work that you participated in, the predictive index, came out of World War II. That's how, how long it's been around. It's not new. It was used in World War II to decide, they used the behavioral profiles to help pilots decide whether they should be a fighter pilot, like a Maverick, more independent, or a B-24 pilot or B-17 pilot with a crew, more of a collaborative teamwork. That's where the data came from. So it's been around a long time. There's been tens of millions of assessments have been uh, administered since the 50s. It's, you know, 70 languages now. You can do it in Braille. So it's available, you know, it's a, a very, very accessible for people. So this is real example of data. And I invite you to think about how you can use this data for your work and engaging with your students and even your own team inside the university or inside the college. All right, M&Ms. One of the things that my wife and I, when we work with leadership teams, I'm gonna say this once, a lot of times, what, what, what do you think happens? Do you think people select people that make them feel comfortable or more like them? You know, that's often what we see. And so we say it's like M&Ms. Everyone looks different on the outside, but they're the same on the inside. <laughs> you look at their behavioral profiles of teams and people go, hey, we all, look, we all have high A's and low B's, isn't that funny? Well, you're comfortable with each other. And part of, you know, part of the beauty of diversity comes in many, many forms, but it's in that tension that comes through creativity and differences that you often re reach better decisions. And so the, we're saying one form of diversity, especially in teams, is to look at behavioral patterns. You can't have all gas pedals. You need some brake pedals, too. You got to have people that are, you know, reflective. Not everybody can just think out loud and spontaneously, you know, come up with ideas all the time. So this is something we really, really pay attention to. And we think the teams that are most powerful are the ones that have the most diversity of style and behavioral drives as well. So this is something that's more subtle, but you can know it through, through the behavioral. It's called a psychometric. The predictive index is a class of uh, assessments called psychometrics. There are many psychometrics out there, uh, many of them. Predictive index was designed not for marital counseling, not for anything else other than contextually, you know, matching somebody with a role, making sure it's a good fit. All right, so what is employee engagement in our world? And, uh, we call it the, the difference between the have to on the bottom and the, uh, and the want to on the top, right? We call the difference discretionary effort. When someone's engaged, they don't do the minimum, right? And when the student's engaged, they don't do just the minimum to get by go above and beyond voluntarily. That's what engagement is in our world. So the question is, how do you activate discretionary effort? How do you get someone to do more than just the minimum? How do you make sure that they can, you know, stretch themselves and actually get into the want to space? Because that's what we call discretionary effort. 
And some of the things that, when it's at the low end, you heard quiet quitting. That's a, a term that's been around since uh, COVID. People kind of show up at work and they just get a paycheck. Maybe they work two jobs if they're remote. We've, I've heard those stories, like two software working for two, two different companies, just doing the minimum amount just to get by. Basically show up and get a check. That's really, the, that's really at the have to level. And what we want to get is more to the you know, innovation, the productivity. And, and this is what engagement is for students too, right? They're just not going through the motions. People that go through the motions often don't stay around, right? They're, they're more readily, you know, uh, they're going to switch potentially because they're not really involved or engaged with the work or with the environment in which they're, 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 they're found. So this is our definition. So discretionary effort. So we're going to talk about the golden rule. How many people remember the golden rule? Right? Do unto others as you have them do unto you. Golden rule doesn't work. And it's not the, who has the gold rules either. That's not the other rule we're talking about. We're talking about the platinum rule now. The platinum rule says do unto, other, do unto others as they need to be done unto. That's the platinum rule. Not do unto others as a, I have them do unto me. It's do unto others as they need to be done unto. How do you know what they need to be done unto if you don't have their data? You don't understand what motivates them. Well, we've, our default strategy as managers is to what? Well, this motivates me, so it must motivate you. Uh, I'm just going to you know, push out what makes me excited, and I'm going to make you know, assume that that works for you too. It often doesn't. So the platinum rule is really important, but you can't do it if you don't have any insight. So why do people behave as they do? Here's the underlying concept. We all have drives, motivations, right? things that motivate us. These become needs. The drives create the needs, and the needs show up as behaviors, right? That's what you, and if all you see is the behavior, like the duck above the water, you're making guess at the drives and needs, right? You're guessing. And typically, your guess is going to be what? Related more to what motivates you. Oh, I see that behavior. This must be a consequence of this. What we're trying to do is flip that with the data and say that if you're guessing at this, you're only going to see the behavior. What we want you to do is if you measure drives, you can predict the needs. If you know what the drives are, you can actually predict the needs and the behaviors, right? That's pretty powerful. If you can predict somebody's behaviors based on their drives, that's going to tell you a lot about how they're going to show up in, in a workplace or in a, in, a, in a job or in a setting uh, in a university, right? So very important. And this is all like blood work. You can know it. You all have your reports. If, you know, if we saw your reports, you read them, and you said, yeah, that's me, you can probably predict the things that are going to motivate you based on your profile, based on how you are. My wife would call it your DNA, your behavioral DNA. We all have it. We're all motivated by certain things. So once again, how much do you know about the students that you're talking to? What are their drives? And if you knew their drives, you know, could you predict how they would respond to different stimuli? That'd be pretty powerful, right? If you knew, hey, there's certain... Versus just what we used to call it. I grew up in marketing like Stan. We used to call it spray and pray. You know, you try everything and hope something works, <laughs> but you're not really sure. Not very effective. So this is really about being targeted and saying, hey, we have a certain students that are motivated by these things. How are we going to interface with them? How are we going to talk to them? What are they going to respond to? What kind of stimuli works best with them? Right? It can be very systematic and deliberate. But you can't tailor an experience if you don't know what you're tailoring it to and how many of them are out there, and which ones best fit your university, which ones, what's the exemplar profiles of your top students in these different majors? Be interesting, one, to see if there's some patterns that you could, then you could say, hey, these are the kinds of people we know do well in our situation, because you're, you're in the same business we are. You're trying to, you're trying to identify, attract, assess, develop, and retain people, right? Students, we're, you know, we're helping clients do that for workers. It's the same challenge. In fact, one of the universities our son went to did such a good job retaining, he, he stayed an extra year. <laughs> he called it a victory lap. <laughs> we didn't call it a victory lap. He thought that was a good thing. We didn't think so much. But uh, yeah, they did a good job retaining him extra, extra year. So this is powerful, and this is what w the data helps you do, helps you unlock. So I'm going to show you. This is a very simple. My pattern is a captain, so I put up the ship captain. Uh, that's what uh, one of 17 patterns. This is pre-1990, the pattern of a, a ship captain. Very, you know, not, you know, very, uh, very high independence. 
What happened in, in shipping, you think, or in technology that would make that profile different as it is now? If you're looking for the optimal ship captain, why would the profile change? Technology, technology changes, right? Do you want someone who's very independent? Do you want someone who follows the, what the, the algorithm says on their instruments? Like, yeah, that's interesting, but I'm going over there. You know, that, it's changed, so the profile's changed. You know, so this is, you know, a lot of times the environment changes what the requirements are for a role. This is a, just one example of how a, a job, a, a ship captain, has changed over time. Less independence, more reflective, more data B, more, you know, reflective. And then uh, C, more steady versus change. You know, more, hey, stay the course, be steady. You know, we don't need a lot of change. And then the, uh, the D, higher uh, process and systems focus. So this is what happens over time, right? All right, so let me give you a real example of a company we work with in the construction industry. You, some of you guys probably train HVAC, po uh, community colleges train plumbing, plumbers, HVAC. So here's the dilemma from my business owners, right? So you hire somebody as a plumber, you help them become an apprentice, right? They get them the tools, they become apprentice. What happens oftentimes once they get skilled and, and very good at what they do? What do you think happens? What's that? They start their own business, right? They go, hey, I can do this. All I need is a pickup truck. I got the tools. I got the know-how. So I'm going to go do this myself. That's a problem, right? When you're hiring plumbers, you're training them, and they don't stay long, and they leave. That's a problem for our companies, right? So what's one solution? Well, one of the things we know from your behavioral profile, and we could tell you by looking at each of your profiles, what about your tolerance for risk? What would I want to avoid? If I'm hiring plumbers and I'm afraid of def them leaving, what's one thing I would not want to have a plumber have a big appetite for? Risk, right? I don't want an entrepreneur plumber who I'm going to teach get them on their feet and they're gonna leave because that's not good for my business, right? So if I'm gonna hire a plumber and train them, I'm gonna pick one that's got a high need for security and has no interest in risk, a low appetite for risk. Does that make sense? In that particular case, that's exactly what our client did. They said, hey, we gotta deal with this. We, we, we'll train them, but we want them to stay. So let's look at their profile and the, the A and the D in your profile, that relationship between the A and the D talks about your risk appetite. Right? If your A is further right than your D, and the bigger the spread between the A to the right and the D to the left, the more you have an appetite for risk. So that's important information to know. You might have things like that that you're insightful about students experience or student retention that will be able to predict whether they're going to be, you know, looking around or be restless, you know, and, and you know, how can you deal with that? Uh, and on the front end, knowing they're coming in with that profile. Any questions about that? That's the real use of data, human people data, in a business context. And I invite you to think about how you can use data like that in your own situations with students. Because you're in that talent war too, right? You've got to get your unfair share of students. And you've got to keep them. You've got to retain them. You've got to make that experience just so seamless that they want to stay. And they get excited and tell 10 other people about it, right? That's what you're looking for. Well, having understanding of how people are, are motivated and, their, and what drives them is a big start for that, to understand how to engage with them in an effective manner. Honestly, if you don't do that, you're just hopeful. Hope is not a strategy. <laughs> you know, it's nice, but it doesn't help. You can't guess. You know, guessing is really risky. Um, you've got all the tools. You've got many tools to help you be much more scientific in it and much more focused on data. All right, talent pools. Now, I didn't know, the, I didn't think about goldfish sand, so we're going to keep with the aquatic uh, theme here, even though we're not in Miami or Wilmington. So here's the deal. Talent pools are getting smaller. Remember the data? So there are fewer people out there. So I bet the student talent pools or student pools are getting smaller, too. There are fewer people to pick from, right? And, and, and so what does that mean? Well, first of all, what's wrong with the talent? Everyone goes to the same pool to fish. And what this means is we have construction companies, we have financial service companies. They go to the same place to find students or find employees or find candidates, right? Well, what happens when that, they go to the same pool? Well, a couple things happen. One is the cost of fish goes up. <laughs> the people go, hey, I'm very sought after as a project manager. Maybe I'm worth more. And you guys want to have a bidding war for my services? Go ahead, go for it. That happens, right? Because then the project managers realize, hey, I'm a scarce, I'm in scarce supply. 
I got construction background. If I'm going to be in demand, I might as well get as much as I can. And companies will, you know, it, the salaries go up. The other thing is the, the fish get recirculated. That means that you, you fish in the same fish recirculate amongst companies. You know, they move from one company to the next. So it's, it's a problem, right? So why not fish somewhere else? What can you do to find new talent pools? How can you find candidates that are more, that are viable, but maybe not from the traditional places that you've looked in the past? And this is really important. So you can't do that uh, without a few things that I'm going to share with you. The challenge in business today is a lot of people don't have a lot of work experience, right? We call that a skinny resume, right? You scratch the surface, there's more surface. <laughs> there's, no, there's just not a lot of depth of work experience, right? They just don't have it. There's just not a lot of people out there and they don't have a lot of depth. So the question is, can they learn it? They don't have the work experience, but can they learn, right? Can they learn the job? Can they learn, you know, can they be effective as a learner? And so we, there's a behavioral assessment you took. That was the one you did the report on. There's another one that we call the cognitive assessment. It doesn't measure intelligence. I've taken it. I can validate that. <laughs> it doesn't measure, doesn't measure intelligence. What it measures is learning agility. How fast does someone learn? Now, is that important in a world where people don't have a lot of work experience to know whether someone learns quickly? Has everyone worked with somebody who just gets it? I mean, they just pick it up. You show them a few times, and they pick it up, and they go. They likely have a high G score, which we call learning agility, right? And so why is learning agility important? In the, work, in the working world, learning agility or cognitive is the best predictor of success, even over behavioral. It's one of the strongest predictors of success. And this is from a uh, 2001 American psychology uh, study. So what's the correlation? Everyone knows the strongest correlation you can have is 1.0 between two, two factors, right? If you have a one-to-one one -one relationship, it's the strongest correlation you can have. What do you think the correlation is between ibuprofen and pain relief? Anybody? Well, tonight you might have to test this, but maybe tomorrow. But <laughs> what's, the strong, what's the correlation? What do you think? What is it? Which one? Far left. 18. I know, I know. They, they make you think it's like a placebo, right? Well, it's a great quarter. It's only 18, 18%, 0.18. That's, that's the ibuprofen, the relief of a headache. That's the correlation. We'll do another one just for fun. You like to play the game with me. What's the correlation between the distance of the equator and the temperature? How close? You're closer to the equator. What do you think the, the correlation is between distance from the equator and temperature? <laughs> close. 0.6. Arrow's a little off, but it's 0.6. <laughs> Just seeing if you're paying attention. <laughs> Just seeing if you're watching. That's pretty strong, right? Yeah, it makes sense. You're close to the equator. It's probably hot, right? There's going to be a stronger influence. What is the correlation between cognitive ability and job performance? You know the answer. 0.65, even though it's at 0.41. Whoever did this is not a fast learner. Put this in there in the wrong place. So this is, this is an American psychology study. Pretty strong stuff, right? So if, I wanna, if I'm taking a bet on somebody who's got a skinny resume or someone doesn't look perfect, but they have the behavioral fit and they have a high cognitive, that's pretty important to know. How fast do they learn? Learning agility. We call that. That's a G score. That is really powerful, right? How fast does someone learn? So this is something that is kind of a secret sauce in hiring today. You know, it's finding, you know, hey, I'm going to go to different talent pools because if I can go to different talent pools and find somebody who's a good behavioral fit, doesn't have the experience, but I know they learn and we pour into them with the skill part, they're probably going to be successful. So this is really, uh, really something that's important. So Alvin Toffler, he's dead now. He was a futurist, like Stan. He wrote many books, and my favorite quote from him is, the illiterate of the 21st century won't be those who can't read and write. It'll be those who can't learn, unlearn, and relearn. I think that's very powerful. That's learning agility. Why is that so important today? What's the rate of change? How much new stuff is coming at us? Chat GBT, all AI. I mean, if you can't learn and adapt, you're going to have a hard time in the world be successful. So learning agility is exactly attached to that. That's the illiterate. So, you know, our ability to be agile, to adapt, and to be flexible is so critical. And we can know that about people before we even talk to them. That's pretty powerful to know where they are in terms of their learning agility. 
That's an important piece of data. So not only is the behavioral part important, do they fit? Do they fit the job? Do they fit the culture? What's their learning speed? How fast do they learn? What's their cycle time for learning? Some jobs require high, some not so much. But there are certain jobs where, you know, the pace of change is fast and they have to be very adaptable. Okay? All right, so this is my Lowe's and skinny jeans. What the heck's that about? True story. Uh, this is a true story. Construction company owner um, that I'm working with. He is tired of hiring project managers from the big construction companies for a lot of reasons, right? Uh, he's a smaller firm. Um, they come with bad habits, big company habits. You have to break their habits. You know, they do things differently. They have a niche business, very high touch, white glove. Big, guy, big companies don't exactly do that. Sometimes they're, you know, more of a big flywheel, just volume. And so he had trouble hiring from those. And plus, they're probably pay scales pretty high coming from a big company. So it's really hard for him to find project managers in, in construction. And so we, we talked and we convinced him to, to take, use the cognitive and behavioral. And he said, this is a true story, he said, my biggest fear is that I'm going to find some latte drinking, skinny jeans wearing person from Raleigh. <laughs> He's out in Greenville. <laughs> It's gonna, it's gonna do well on this, and I'm gonna have to bring him into the team, and they're gonna look at him and go, are you kidding me? You know, that was his words, skinny jeans, latte drinking. And they go, it doesn't matter, let's find out. And so anyways, he did the assessment on somebody who was working at Lowe's, had no construction background, you know, no project management experience, but was a behavioral fit, and had an off the scale cognitive score. He hired that person, betting on, hey, this person will learn, they fit the culture, that person is his best project manager. That's an example of a new talent pool going somewhere unexpected using behavioral data, people data, to make a decision confidently. But it was fun to get, it was, it was tough getting there, but he, he, he jumped into it, used the data, and, and made the decision. And so now he's a big proponent of going to new talent pools. And so when you're stressed trying to find candidates for your school, think about talent pools, think about places to find them, right? Maybe non-traditional, but pay attention to what's important, do they fit? The exemplar profile, the behavioral profile, the students that do the best, and are there other, you know, cognitive things about learning? Maybe they don't have the best high school record, you know, academically. I didn't. I got on in probation in college. I, should, I said that on, on recording, didn't I? Um, yeah, so that happened a long time ago. But <laughs> I got through the first year. And, uh, but I, I think I had a pretty high learning ability, and I think they didn't measure it back then, but I think that's what helped me. So that's a real story. So here's my message to you. You're not stuck in traffic. You are traffic. <laughs> what does that mean? That means that if you're going to change, you've got to make the change. You can't listen to the news and say, oh, there's not enough students. The population trends are you know, not supportive of us. That's victim thinking. You've got to say, how do we get out ahead of this? How do we do something different? How do we differentiate ourselves using data to get ahead of everyone else? So we get our unfair share of student candidates. We can select them. We don't have to sell them. We can select people. We can say, you know what, you're a good fit. This makes sense. Versus being a supplicant going, oh, please consider our school. <laughs> right? Different mindset. And knowing what works and what is best fit for your school. You've got to have data. I believe, I'm, I'm proposing to you, you have to have data to help make that decision around people. And then finally, here's what I want you to say, mantra the rest of the week. Analytics, not opinions. Analytics. Opinions are great. Everyone's got them. But a uh, you know, person with opinion is interesting. People with data are, in, are more interesting. I think you know, it's not obviating your intuition. You still can have instincts, but you've got to couple it with data to overcome some of the cognitive biases and the things that we you know, as human beings have. And uh, hopefully some of these things I've shared with you motivate you, give you hope to say, hey, we can solve the people puzzle. We can use data in ways we haven't thought about in the past. It's all out there. You don't have to reinvent it. You just got to think about what works in your environment and get profiles of success. Your best students have a certain DNA, I would imagine. When we did that study for the customer, one of our clients, we did the 300 people, we didn't know what the data would say. We, took a, we thought there'd be a difference, but we didn't know for sure until we saw the data and we said, it's so obvious. It stands out. Even if you don't understand the data, you can see differences from looking at the chart, that there's big differences between the, the high performers and the average performer. So that's my call to action for you. Analytics, not opinions. Challenge, use data, figure out how to incorporate people data, and then get your unfair share of the students that are out there trying to find you. All right.
Thank you very much.